Welcome back, fellow Armchair Generals. This is Gamer1745 here with my continuing playthrough of Hearts of Iron 3 with Black Ice 8 and Third Reich events installed. Well, let's continue Sea Lion. Does that have any intro? Oh, we haven't occupied Newport yet. We'll have to get to that at some point. Continue our operation Sea Lion. Trying to seal off London here. Good, we've got up to Ipswich. Dropped some. Oh, I'm going, or I'm going to be dropping some. Yeah, return back to wherever it is you came from. Yeah, Bitbridge could go back to Bitbridge. Keep having it pop over for that. Thought I had some paratroopers coming in. There they are. There they are. Okay, good. We've got London surrounded. Finally. Coal rationing. Not right now. Nor do we need any metal. Well, this is going to be interesting. Okay, um, let's see. I believe this is a Black Ice event. I know it's not a TRE event. Okay, um... After the loss of the Battle of Atlantic and following the lack of um, strategic orientation on how to continue the naval war, the Craig Marine gave up its autonomy for their armaments and passed it on to the responsibility of Speer's Rice Ministry for Armament and War Production in 43, being in favor of the new And it's the focus of the production, concentrated on submarines in order to keep up the high numbers of newly built U-boats and coming spear continued the production of obsolete submarines and did not manage to achieve a strategically relevant um, turn in the Reich's naval armament. However, production numbers of the U-boats rose significantly due to the rationalization of production change and higher allocation of stealth contingents for the Craig's Marine don't quite get what it's still. Is that supposed to be steel? I guess it's steel contingents. Probably just a misspelling. Okay, I can be quite um, uh, guilty of misspellings in my events too, so it's not a big deal. Okay, that's Spear. I believe that's Donuts there. Um, don't recognize who that army officer is. The rest are naval guys. That's an army though. Um, Obviously, next to a ship there. I hadn't seen that photo before, Spear. Okay, let's see. Yeah, we can afford that. We'll go with that. Naval build speed. We like that. I know we've talked about the whole thing a bit earlier about um, things like snorkels and um, I'll let them get organized up first um, different hull forms and 
things. And the Germans did basically, I mean, did very much what um, the event just said in that they did not move ahead like they were doing with the Luftwaffe. Um, moving ahead with new types. Back here again, god damn. Where the German Air Force was constantly working on new fighter types. The Navy just wasn't. Okay, this is the newly created unit by Vance. Not well organized up yet, but I wanted to get it across. I'll need to attach this to an HQ as well. So I've gotten the fuel yet. Oh wow, look at all these units. A couple airborne divisions, but it's just all of this stuff. You can tell I'm still just scrolling through garrison division after garrison division. Reinforcement. Reinforcing division. These are the units that I destroyed or messed up, I think, down in Africa that all came back up to here. At least some of the ones that are that give me strength. They shattered. Look at that, look at that. More and more. And more. Still scrolling through this guys. Finally down there. I don't want to turn this into an airborne battle. I do believe just by simply dropping in some paras there, all the division commanders around there will get some experience as a airborne general. And back again, still flicking through them too fast.
And road networks have advanced. Oh good. Getting a session island. Move back to Eric. Again. Okay. get London here soon, I hope. Okay, because we just grabbed Penzance, though we still haven't got Newport, we have the English Channel effect. But we can control both sides of it, which means obviously there's lots and lots of trade. Um, obviously rails had changed things a lot, but um, prior to rails, a lot of the trade did flow through the English Channel. Instead of over land, you'd come down or, you know, you're going over to somewhere over here, you come down the river, and then, you know, this is like the 18th century and early 19th century, come up via ship to here or vice versa, as opposed to trying to go overland. But even with the rails, it will still help move supplies. So we've got more supplies, more money, more supply throughput, more resources all moving more effectively. Okay, 
Leipstein Dart, Leipstein Dart is under attack. Okay, um... Uh, this isn't displaying right. I think there's an error in that the title, the description, the title is doing both the description and so it's doing it twice. The title's pointing to the description. Okay, basically, um, this well, this is an event uh, contributed by Pavolini, my Italian friend and contributor here. Um, there, um, as Italy was falling apart, um, and there's multiple reasons for Italy falling apart in this war. Um, the big one is, uh, I don't even know if still today, I'm, I know I'm an outsider and all, but um, I don't even know that there's a um, single national identity for, for Italy yet. Um, the North is very different than the South, culturally speaking, acceptance of things like the Mafia. You go back to um, some of the stuff that I've looked at in the 18th century, um, the Bourbon kings down here that um, looked as much to like France or to Spain and or France as they did to um, look to it Italy as, as sort of their um, you know where they were most loyal to um, in the north you have a lot of Austrian control often in sort of puppet state type situations. Um, so Victor Emmanuel, of course, um, united the country. Geographically speaking, that is, he united the country. And so by the time you come up to World War II, you had um, Italy, well, just slightly before it, Italy's part of the Central Powers, which is a defensive pact between um, the um, Kaiser of Germany, the Kaiser of Austria, and the King of Italy. Well, Italy definitely correctly saw the um, war against Serbia as something out of an offensive war. It still, obviously, it was a um, Serbia-supported um armed, I mean, literally gave the guns to the guys who killed the Archduke of Ferdinand. So that was an act of war, killing the heir to the throne. You know, so that's, you know, totally justifies, in my opinion, um, Austria's invasion of Serbia. You know, you go, oh, they behaved bad, you know, the Austrians behaved badly and things like this. Yes, they did, but Totally, you know, you, you, you kill, you know, it's like killing the vice president or something. Kill the vice president of my country, even though you sort of, um, you, and you, and they did, they, they found this out before, before, that's why it took them however many months it was from the killing to, to the invasion of Serbia. Um, you find out that country X, um, supplied the guns and got the people into place to kill the vice president. I'm for invading your country, okay, even though the, the people that did it may not be um, citizens of your, you know, they wanted, they were sort of um, people that wanted a greater Serbia or whatever, um, you know, even if they're, you know, third party people or something like that, I'm still for invading your country. So I totally agree with um, Austria's right to invade Serbia at the start of World War I, but it's not really a um, defensive war. Now, Russia was coming in on Serbia's side. That sort of kind of does make it a defensive war. And Germany more or less knows that France is going to come in on Russia's side. So Germany preemptively attacks France. Well, and I, I would sort of to some degree agree that Italy may not need to um, come into the war at that. And I'm not a detailed expert on 
on the treaty and whether what was going on. But once Italy sort of saw that the Central Powers were probably not going to win, they went for the land grab. They turned on their theoretical former allies and joined you know, the allies, the not the non central power group to, you know, grab Trieste. That was a major war goal for um Italy. As well as, you know, some of these other th places here. Well, basically, um on the Isonzo front that's well I'm right in here. Um Italy didn't do well. If it hadn't been on the winning side, they probably would have lost. And that's so it, it sort of was in the win the winning side of the war. It got territory a lot of its territorial um, ambitions, but most everybody in Italy realized that the government failed and militarily. Their army just was unprepared for the war, um, sending troops into very cold weather up in the higher mountains and a lot of, you know, unnecessary casualties due to frostbite and these type of elements, you know, diseases and just think of all the horrors of a mo pre-modern war with lots of people jammed into it. So it spurred um, revolutionary sentiment like it did in Germany, like it did in Austria. When you had a failed state, the old order failed. Um, there was definitely a leftist, communist, socialist type sentiment rising up. Mussolini, Benito Mussolini, was named after Benito Juarez by his social par socialist parent, Benito Juarez, um, famous president of Mexico, had been a socialist, realizes that the world ain't going to be peaceful with some sort of overall socialist revolution. And he also becomes very much of a nationalist. So he develops fascism along with a few other people ideologically developing, develops fascism in the very, very early 1920s. And so this is, um, and Italy is fairly backward compared to um, other Western European nations like Germany, like France, like Britain, industrially. Not sure whether it's more backward to Spain or not, but it's fairly well backward. So, and that's include land ownership situations and um, farming conditions and th that element to society. And so, there's a clash between right and left of, of a modernist philosophy, Mussolini, on the right. Um, the socialist on the left. Mussolini's a lot of bluster, in my opinion. His march on Rome, basically, it was collapsing when the king sort of saved it and invited Mussolini to help form a government. And that's where you continue with the divide. Um, you have, particularly in the army, a lot of royalists, um, traditionalists, if you will. Um, not that they were all... Oh, I forget... Victor Emmanuel's royal family name or whatever. I think were they Tuscan monarchs? I forget. Sorry, forget. But um, not that they were all devoted to that royal house or to the, to that, but they were traditionalists. They wanted a king. They wanted a parliament. They didn't want a parliament freewheeling that's going to, like in France, that you could have a socialist government or a um, whatever. They wanted a, you know, a limited democracy within their, or with a lot of aristocratic privileges and rights. And so, through the whole war effort, and before the war, there was this tension between um, different factions in, in Italy, where Hitler, very early on, you know, quashes and moves it entirely to National Socialist viewpoint. And all the nationalists have to keep their head down and just sort of do what they have to do. Um, one major element with all of this and an ally to Mussolini, generally speaking, 
is the Ita it Italian industrialists. They want to modernize, industrialize Italy. Fascism promotes that general concept in that um, it's state controlled, but it's still the um, industries are still privately owned. It's not a free market capitalist system, but it's something that the industrialists can work on work with. I'm not saying, and I don't know whether um, the head of Beretta I know is a, a manufacturing company at the time or. Um, many of the others that are just slipping my mind now that were around at the time were particularly ideologically fascist. I'm not suggesting that. I don't know which ones were or weren't, but they just realized that that's the situation. It, it fit in with their plans to improve their factories, whether they thought um, fascism was the wave of the future. I personally, I'm, a, I'm not a big fan of fascism, but and I'm definitely not a believer in fascism as an end result. I come down um, in this sort of end of 19th century, beginning of the 20th century period with these radical changes in society, come down more on a nationalist side um, because there's people being uprooted. I mean, it just when you have a system where it's maybe not quite peasants tied to the land, but um, sort of you know, basic sort of farming, that then that goes away. And so now you have people that there's not yet enough factories to employ people and there's no more working the land to grow food. So even if you have, you know, a inadequate, but some sort of housing, where do you get food? You know, I, I understand that, you know, I, I'm a freedom guy. I'm a capitalist type guy, but I understand that there's, you know, a critical response because I'm an American I saw how you know it's going with America until you get to the Dust Bowl and even then it was bad in just some areas through the through America's industrialization there was always somewhere to go to get land to grow food to live on there was always the ability for most everyone to do something to survive we can talk about the hardships. There were hardships, you know, people coming out of slavery, you know, a lot of, lot of stuff, a lot of hardships going on in America. It wasn't always perfect. I'm not trying to say that, but it was, you know, there was an immediate way you could pick up and walk and go somewhere and settle and do something. Now it was risky. It was dangerous. You can look at some of the documentaries on like the gold rush to California and all the people that were dying on the way there, sometimes from Indian attacks, sometimes from bandit attacks, um, sometimes again, uh, just in you know, an environmental situation, dysentery and other diseases that they had very little understanding for. People were dying to get out, get out there, but there was always that sort of ability to go and do. So we had a different mindset. So like I say, I'm a freedom sort of guy, but when you get this chaos of, of a collapsing situation I'm not a person that thinks that fascism is an absolutely wrong thing to do during a transition period I am but you can tell I'm sort of being very cautious of what I say here because it obviously could be taken badly I'm not in any way trying to promote fascism up or um, endorse it as a as the best way to go but I'm sort of looking at what happens when an old order collapses, the old aristocratic, the old society collapses, and before you have a reworked society that can handle the whatever the new society is, and when you don't have education widely available, you know, even basic reading and writing and things like that, I don't know the educational like levels of a, of a farmer in, in Italy in 1900 or 1920, but I doubt that they were overly good. So, with that said, you know, okay, fascism sort of kind of worked to manage, in my opinion, can, to manage the the transition. I don't, I don't think it's a good, good ultimate solution where a proper fascist believes that fascism is not just a transition um, 
uh, mode, but the ultimate goal to get to. So, and I to to evaluate um, political and and economic organizations, I have to evaluate partially in their effectiveness, They're how much I like them and how effective they are, um, and basically more or less economically national socialism and fascism are the same and that's what everybody sort of focuses on is their um uh economic viewpoint you know it's sort of like what's the difference between communism and socialism in many ways economically not a whole lot and i know i'm speaking to a lot of europeans here who either are currently or have lived under, um, some of them lived under communism. Many of them, like in Sweden, are, you know, lived under socialism. And they'll go, oh, there's a lot, yeah, okay, there's a lot of different. But the goal of the socialism, as I understand it, and there, you can maybe find an individual socialist or socialist politician who doesn't believe that, but generally the goal of socialism is to eventually get to communism. Now, maybe... 10 generations down the road as you slowly get there as you slowly tinker with you know just what does communism mean and, and work there but where the um, people through the apparatus of the state own the means of production that's how i understand socialism to eventually be now there's a lot of things you know i'm a bit more you know i've taken european political classes so i know sort of a lot about different countries in western europe and their socialist things but i know more about britain they nationalized a bunch of um factories in britain that's social that's the state owning the means of production how is that any different than communism well maybe the local butcher just needed a, a basic business license and otherwise was able to set his own prices well yeah during the um rationing period he couldn't but in the 70s or whatever he probably could under the social labor socialist government so it isn't such you know top down at every level that the communist state which were going on but the government was nationalizing automobile factories luxury you know like jaguar or whatever i think was for a while owned by the government <laughs> really you know okay how is that any different than the soviet union now in the and now what I'm looking at is the economic census here, and not necessarily at you know you can again point out lots of differences that there was a king in um, in Britain and they still own allowed larger landowners and yeah of course there was a lot of social and cultural differences and political organization differences but the economic mode is what I'm sort of talking about here now now so between socialism. And communism is sort of a path. International communism or international socialism can also can be very violent and revolutionary, where a lot of our social democrats that want to build consensus in society and don't want to shoot a lot of people to get their goals. Those are some of the differences. Another major difference between a lot of socialists and communists is that socialists, a lot of socialists can believe in God and believe in the church as a good, positive influence in society. And I truly do mean believe in the Christian, basic Christian beliefs. Where a communist, if you're a proper Leninist, Marxist, communist, you believe religion is the opiate of the masses and hence God and particular, even if you may or may, or may not believe in a creator, God or being, the Christian Jews, Muslims, their their prophets were just um, delusional men, and so that that's all they were, and so that it, it's a false thing. So if you're a Leninist Marxist, you believe that you can't properly believe in that. You, know, you can modify it and whatever, but if you're a Leninist Marxist, you believe you don't believe in God. So that is the difference. So that's gets back to the point of. National Socialism or Nazism had the racial component, had the um, esoteric neo-paganistic religious component that you see throughout their symbology, which was 
and their use of the May Day celebrations that they sort of hijacked in a way from the left, but they also rebranded it to go back to a paganistic tradition. So you see a lot of that in National Socialism that is not shared in fascism. Fascism um, either generally believed in the church or made accommodations for the church. It depends on where you are and what you're looking at it. So fascism is much more of an economic reorganization of society. There are cultural and social aspects, but that's what really makes them, you know, so if people go, what's the difference between fascism and national socialism? Well, the way they're organizing their economies aren't necessarily significantly different. Um, but the way their belief systems are different. So, but back to, I, I haven't forgotten how I started on the tangent here, but back to fascism. Economically, I'm not saying it works the best, but economically, fascism works. Communism, socialism, especially when you're talking socialism, that owns the means of the state, the people through the state owns the means of production, doesn't work. It just economically doesn't work. Uh, you can talk about socialist elements, you know, yeah. I could see if, if we're talking about Luxembourg here, socialized medicine, you know, one or more government hospitals. Yeah, okay, that's a service to the populace of a small, limited um, organization. I can get on board with it in, in a scale of Luxembourg. Scale of the United States, nationalized medicine, one, one national government health service. God, that would be horrifying. And I wish that all the people that want government health would be horrified at what that system would be, how terrible it would be. Maybe might work with 50 health systems, one for each state. Like I say, go to Rhode Island out here, just one little sort of here. Yeah, it can work on that scale. I don't think it can work like in my state, in California. All these people, I don't think it's going to work. Now you can talk about... Um, Healthcare plans to take care of people, that's different than the government owning the hospitals, if you will. So, you can talk about certain elements of socialism that can work, like, and that does work in parts of Europe currently. But that, in my mind, is different than um, the general means of production being owned by the people collectively through the state. If you want to have people collectively own the means of production, encourage, if, if you feel that that's important, encourage all major corporations to be publicly traded stock companies so that the people can buy shares in the companies. The unions can buy big bulks of the shares in the companies so that the unions can own a good portion of the company. They can maybe buy out all of the shares of the company so that the workers own the, the means of production through a capitalist mechanism. It can be done that way. That can work if that is your goal. I don't have that as my goal, but if that is your goal, it can work. So this is what I'm evaluating fascism on at the moment is it does work. I don't think it works the best. I don't think it works as well as communism. I mean, uh, sorry, capitalism. Um, it doesn't work as well as capitalism, but if you're trying to organize up a state for a particular goal, winning a war, you, okay, um, the U.S. government very much really didn't own any of the means of production for the war effort. There are a few government arsenals and a few minor things like this. It was private industry, but it was all directed by the government, and it very effectively mobilized the United States to go to war. So for a single goal, it works. Like if you're trying to develop a space program and it's going to take a lot of industry, if you wanted to build a, lots of rocket ships, not just a few going up once in a while, but I mean like really building a colony in space or something, okay, then you may need nationally organized economies to work to do that. So a fascist, you know, what happened in the U.S. during the war is different than fascism. It may be subtle in some people's minds, but it is different. 
So Italy, so back, get back to it. Italy was, had um, the desire to increase its industry, industrial capabilities. So aircraft manufacturers, tank manufacturers in Italy wanted to build Italian designed tanks and aircraft. They resisted the um, use of German designs. You know, they could have, they had the technology. I've been talked to a few people and read some stuff. They did have the, the technological abilities. Now they have to rework their factory some, but they had the technological abilities to set up and make a Panzer IV, say. No, they didn't want to do that. They wanted to continue with their process and develop their tank or their aircraft. And they did put together, I think it was mostly put together, I think it's something like 400 Stuka dive bombers in Italy. I think they're just assembly work. I don't think that they were, you know, start to finish manufacture. Um, so there was some of that, but there wasn't a lot, and it was mostly... Um, Italy's um, industry um, resisting it as well as I think some of the um, royalist factions not wanting to get too close to Germany because you got to remember in the last war Italy and Germany were enemies and especially since this new Germany includes Austria um, Austria the bitter enemy and with Hitler's goals they might conflict with some of the royalist type goals so that there wasn't wanting they, they weren't wanting uh, a lot of penetration of Italy by by Germany they wanted to you know keep it sort of their own so it fell apart because of because of these conflicts in society and industry and I know this one event gave me a lot to talk about here so, as they were still falling apart, um, and this is set up like in July 43, um, I'm not good with dates and exactly what's going on, but pretty sure um, Sicily has been taken by this time. I don't know if they've yet landed um, along the coast, but they um, want to finally get um, some material support from Germany and this event basically they asked Himmler's SS for some uh, technological support and there will be a few other events to this um, some equipment basically and I think we're going to see some things they want you to get some like Panzer IVs to equip up eventually, and they're going to be a, um, a division, I believe. But I don't know how... I'm trying to remember. Just, I know I, it was contributed by Pavolini, and I sort of looked at the code at the time and all of that. I'm trying to remember how much. But um, And they also get, um, you know, like FLAC, eight, FLAC 36, the 18, the 88 millimeter, um, anti-aircraft guns and other things to equip at least one good mechanized division. Um set up so that's what this is all about yeah long way around to get there so that's when I evaluate things I have to evaluate one on how much I may like them two how effective something is because you may like it but if it's not effective, you know, art is pleasing to the eye. So, you know, it does, it, it matters how much you like it more than anything else. But if you're talking about um, how to organize up your society, you may like a chaotic um, cultural and social situation but if it um, ultimately doesn't feed people doesn't provide for your defense then um, there's something wrong
Now we're taking down the Air Force. Our Atler Tog Eagle Day seems to have worked out fairly well. So all this started, and I was going to prepare. I don't know if you if I posted, if you read what I posted, but I was posting. Well, I've got to prepare and make sure I'm really ready for the invasion and get all the units there. And then I just decided, hey, this is going to work, and I just <laughs> just jumped in. And so far, it's I, I you don't think they're going to push me out of Britain. I don't foresee that as being a likely case. Well, at least this time that we're attacking, we're not having to worry about supply or too many supply problems. No need at the moment. I'm back here. Damn it, keep falling for that. supplies into King's Land. Go for Amsterdam. We should bring them out over to there. Now with that, let's see. Here we won the Battle of Leicester. Those guys parachute it in. What's going on up here? I'm on some of their bombers, okay. 
Tut ja nicht Let's see, hand charm, bringing that in because it's an alpine unit or mountain unit. Not really alpine. Another unit. Send it to Wales and later to Scotland. Nordland. Good, we're driving the Americans out. Okay, we enforced conquer. Paul. They've already retreated out of here. Okay, we're going to get into Cardiff, Nottingham, Shrewsbury. Okay, I think we're going to end, end the episode here. Only one long diatribe by me. So... Thanks so much for watching. Appreciate you um, liking the videos and please post your comments. See you next time.